Hi, this is a review for Unit 12, Evolutionary Biology. In this unit, you learned about two things. One thing that you learned about is how populations change over time. And second, you learned about a principle called the Hardy-Weinberg Law. And this principle is used by many population geneticists in order to understand how much a population has been changing. We know that populations change over time. And we know that when we see a large diversity of species that those species all shared some common ancestor in the past. For example, let's look at bats. All the different species of bats that you see today originated from a common ancestor that existed about 53 million years ago. And from that one common ancestor, we now see in the world about 1,100 different species of bats. So modifications and changes in those ancestral populations led to all the diversity that you see today. So let's first talk about how we can apply this Hardy-Weinberg law when studying how populations change. The first objective on page 173 for unit 12 says list the five assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg law and recognize the consequences of violating each. So when a population is not changing at all, we say that it is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So in other words, we're stating that the allele or gene frequencies in that population are remaining constant over time. However, in order for a population to be in equilibrium, that population must meet five assumptions. And you want to memorize these five assumptions that must be met in order for a population to not be changing. So first, there has to be random mating within the population. So that means that the mixture of genes within that population are random. Also, that population must be large. And if a population is large, then there's going to be no genetic drift happening within that population. Furthermore, there has to be no migration. So individuals cannot be moving in and out of this population. So in other words, this must be a closed system. So there's no gene flow in or out. Fourth, there has to be no natural selection. So no pressure or selection for certain genes. And fifth, there has to be no mutations. If there's some sort of gene mutation, then that's going to introduce new alleles into a population, and that will cause the population to change. So there must be no mutations for that population to remain in equilibrium. If you are observing a population and you notice that the allele frequencies or gene frequencies in that population are changing over time, then that means that one of these five assumptions must be being violated. And if one of these five assumptions is being violated, then and those gene frequencies are changing over time, then that population is evolving. So based on this, we know that the mechanisms that cause evolutionary change to happen are violations of this Hardy-Weinberg law. So non-random mating can result in evolutionary change. If populations are very small, then gene frequencies can just drift or change randomly within that population, and that is called genetic drift. If there's migration happening between populations, then this can lead to what's called gene flow, and this causes allele frequencies to also change. Natural selection favors certain genes and causes them to become more prevalent in a population, leading to evolutionary change. And mutations can actually lead to evolutionary change as well because they introduce new alleles into the population. Objective two says calculate gene frequencies from phenotypic data. So this is probably one of the most challenging things for many students to do with this unit, but the more you practice uh, doing these calculations, the easier they're going to get. Okay, So that's with anything that you do. So just keep doing practice problems over and over again. And eventually, you'll realize that you're, you're just doing the same thing over and over again. You're following the same steps each time. When we calculate the gene frequencies, we're calculating them based on the gene pool in that population. So we're looking at the total number of alleles for a specific gene in that population. In order to calculate the total number of alleles in a population, it's really simple. We know that each individual has two alleles for a gene, right? Remember, each individual has two copies of a gene because we are diploid organisms. 
So if you want to calculate the total number of alleles for a gene in a population, you just take the number of individuals and you multiply it by two. When you are calculating frequencies, you want to write them out as a decimal usually. And there's three different types of frequencies that you should be comfortable calculating. And you should know the difference in these frequencies or what you are calculating when you're calculating these. Uh, one is called a gene or allele frequency. So when we're calculating the gene or allele frequency, we're trying to figure out how often we see a particular allele or letter in the population. So how many big A's are there? How many little A's are there in the population? This is very different from when we're looking at a genotype frequency. When we're looking at the genotype frequency in an individual, we want to see how many individuals have a particular allele combination. So how many individuals are homozygous dominant, how many individuals are heterozygous, and how many individuals are homozygous recessive in the population. And then you might also be asked to calculate a phenotype frequency. So this is how often we see a particular physical trait in a population. One important thing to remember is that individuals that are showing the dominant trait could potentially have two different types of genotypes. They could either be homozygous dominant or they could be heterozygous. And we don't know that just by looking at them. However, individuals that are expressing the recessive trait can only have one type of genotype, and that is to be homozygous recessive. Let's do some practice calculating these frequencies. However, usually when you're asked to calculate these frequencies, um, you aren't giving the individual's genotypes. So you don't know if they're homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive. However, if we assume the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we can just use two equations and we can calculate all these frequencies. So the two equations that you want to be able to use are one equation that you use to calculate the allele frequencies. In order to represent the frequency of the dominant allele, we always use the letter P. In order to calculate the frequency of the recessive allele, or how many little a's there are, we use the letter Q. And since we only have two different types of allele, the dominant allele and recessive allele, the frequency of the dominant allele plus the frequency of the recessive allele has to equal 1, or 100%. The second equation that you need to be able to use is one that allows you to calculate the genotype frequencies. So that is the frequency of being homozygous dominant, heterozygous, or homozygous recessive. The variable we use for the frequency of being homozygous dominant is simply p squared. Okay, so p times p, p squared. The frequency of an individual being heterozygous is represented by the variable 2pq. The frequency of being homozygous recessive is represented by q squared. And we know that since we only have three different genotypes in a population, if we were to add up all these variables together, it better equal 1 or 100%. So p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. Or in other words, the frequency of being homozygous dominant plus the frequency of heterozygotes in the population plus the frequency of the homozygous recessive individuals better equal 100%. Let's do some practice calculating these frequencies using this population of p's here. Just by looking at this population of p's here and knowing that the dominant allele causes them to be purple and the recessive allele causes them to be white, we can easily figure out the phenotype frequencies. We know that the frequency of them being purple is, well, let's count out how many are purple. Well, there are 16 purple ones here out of 25. So you just do 16 divided by 25 and that gives you a frequency of 0.64. The frequency of them being white, well, if you count up the white ones, there's 9 of them. So you just do 9 divided by 25, and that's 0.36. Now, by knowing the phenotype frequencies, can we figure out the genotype frequencies and allele frequencies? Well, it's really difficult for us to do anything with the frequency of purple individuals because the frequency of them having the dominant trait is equal to the frequency of them being homozygous dominant and the frequency of the heterozygotes in the, in, the, in the population. So the frequency of being purple would equal p squared plus 2pq. So you can't really do anything with that because now you have two variables here and you just can't solve for two variables at once. However, let's look at the frequency of them having the recessive trait. 
being white? Well, we know that those that are white have to be homozygous recessive. So we know that, that has, the frequency of them being white would have to equal Q squared. So we know Q squared then, therefore equals the frequency of them being white or having the recessive trait, which equals 0.36. So we know the frequency of them being homozygous recessive is also 0.36. Since we know that, we can actually work from there. So the important thing that you need to know when you're doing any of these Hardy-Weinberg problems is you always want to start with the frequency of the homozygous recessive individuals. Or other words, start with Q squared. Even if you're given the frequency of the individuals in the population with the dominant trait, you always have to use that to figure out how many have the recessive trait and start from the recessive trait. Okay, so if you remember anything, try to always start with the recessive trait when solving these problems. Because once we know what Q squared is, we can easily figure out all the other genotype frequencies and allele frequencies just by doing simple mathematical operations. So how can we get from Q squared to Q? All you do is you take the square root of Q squared, which is 0.36, and you get 0.6. Now that we know that Q equals 0.6, we can easily figure out P. P plus Q equals 1. So 1 minus Q would equal 1 minus 0.6, which equals 0.4. So notice 0.4 plus 0.6 equals 1. Now that we know what both P and Q are, we can easily, therefore, figure out what P squared is. So to figure out what P squared is, you just take P times P, or 0.4 squared and you get 0.16. To figure out what the frequency of the heterozygotes are, you just do 2pq, and that's simply 2 times 0.4 times 0.6, and that gives us 0.48. Another thing I just want to point out here is that notice that the number of, or the frequency of the homozygous dominant individuals, 0.16 plus 0.48 equals 0.64, which is the frequency of individuals with the dominant trait let's talk about some tips for solving Hardy-Weinberg problems. When you solve these problems, first off, you just need to have these two equations memorized. Okay, Know what each variable stands for. P and Q are referring only to the alleles, and well, the second equation is referring to the genotypes. First thing you need to do is determine what symbols are you get being given. Are they telling you how many individuals have the recessive trait? Are they telling you how many individuals have the dominant trait? Are they telling you uh, what the frequency of the alleles are? So you need to figure out which of these variables you're being given. And if possible, try to start with Q squared here. Then what you need to do is determine what symbol you are being asked to solve for. Are they asking you to solve for the frequency of the heterozygotes? Are they asking you to solve for the frequency of the dominant allele, the recessive allele, homozygous recessive individuals? Furthermore, are they asking you to solve for a frequency, or are they asking you for the number of individuals that have a certain genotype? If they're asking for the number of individuals, then you have to take an extra step to figure out the problem. Some other important tips, always finding Q squared for, first. You want to figure out the frequency of individuals with the recessive trait, um, because that will equal Q squared. And then you can follow this chart really to figure out everything else. Um, this little flow chart is something that I saw uh, someone use in the past, and I think it could be very helpful. When you start with Q squared, all you got to do is take the square root of that to get Q. And then you know that you can easily get P from there, because just 1 minus Q equals P. And then once you have Q and P, you can easily solve for 2PQ, and then you can easily solve for P squared. Also, show all your work for full or partial credit. Keep your work in decimal form, don't leave things as fractions, and clearly circle your final answer. You're going to have a lot of variables written everywhere, and we want to know that you know uh, what the final answer is. Let's do some practice solving these Hardy-Weinberg problems. This is sample test item number one on page 171 if you want to follow along with me. It says, in ladybugs, spotted is dominant to no spots. So the first thing you want to do when you read any problem like this is write out a little key. So we know dominant equals spots, recessive equals no spots. In a population of 300 ladybugs that is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, 
48 individuals have no spots. So we know that 48 of them have no spots. So what's the frequency of individuals without spots? It's simply 48 divided by 300, which equals 0.16. We know that the frequency of individuals with the recessive trait equals the frequency of them being homozygous recessive. So we're already given Q squared here. All right, so we have Q squared equals the frequency of the homozygous recessive, which is 0.16. And what are they asking us for? They're asking us how many of the ladybugs are heterozygous. So what variable are they asking us to solve for? Well, we know that heterozygous, the frequency of being heterozygous is 2PQ. So they're asking us for the number of individuals that are 2PQ. So in order to get to 2PQ, we are given Q squared in this case. We got to first solve for Q, then solve for P, and then we can just plug it in to get what 2 times P times Q equals. So Q equals the square root of Q squared, which is point, square root of 0 0.16, which is 0 0.4. To get P, we know that P plus Q equals 1. So 1 minus Q would equal P, and that's 0 0.6. And then we just plug in what P and Q equals into our equation. So 2 times P times Q equals our frequency of heterozygotes, which would equal 2 times 0 0.6 times 0 0.4, which equals 0 0.48. We're not done there because they're asking us for the number of heterozygous individuals in the population. So we know 48% of them are heterozygous, so we just do 0.48 times the total population size, and that gives us 144 individuals in that population would be heterozygotes, according to the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Let's do another practice problem. It says, in rats, black fur is dominant to white fur. So remember, make your key to start out. So dominant is black fur, recessive is white fur. In a population of 300 rats, 252 have black fur. So they're telling us how many individuals have the dominant trait. So that's 252 out of 300, so 0.84. Can we start there? Can we do anything with that? Remember, we can't start with the dominant phenotype. So we have to first figure out how many have the recessive phenotype. So always start with Q squared. So remember, Q squared equals the frequency of being homozygous recessive, which equals the frequency of having the recessive trait. To figure out what Q squared is in this case here, all you gotta do is take one minus 0.84, and that gives you 0.16. So now we know that Q squared is 0.16. What are they asking us to solve for? How many rats in this population are homozygous dominant? So what variable are we solving for if we're looking for homozygous dominant? Well, we're looking for P squared. So they're asking us for the number of individuals that are P squared. To get to P squared from Q squared, you have to first solve for Q, then you can solve for P, and then you can solve for P squared. So we got Q, which is the square root of Q squared, which gives us 0.4. P is simply 1 minus Q, which is 0.6. Then we just got to do P squared, which is the frequency of homozygous dominant. 0.6 squared is 0.36. Now we want to know how many of our individuals are homozygous dominant. So are we going to multiply 0.36 by 252 or by 300? Remember, you're going to multiply it by the total population size. So 0.36 times 300 equals 108. So in this case, we have 108 individuals in this population would be homozygous dominant if this population was in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. If you want more problems to work with, uh, stick around to the end of this video and I'll just go through a couple extra problems. Objective 3 says, recognize the effects of gene flow on gene frequencies in natural populations. And objective four says recognize the effects of genetic drift on gene frequencies in natural populations and distinguish the founder effect from a population bottleneck. One common mistake that students make is that they mix up genetic drift and gene flow. So notice that when we're talking about genetic drift, we're talking about population size, so the effects of a small population size. When we're talking about gene flow, we're talking about the effects of migration. One of the most important things here is just knowing the difference between gene flow 
and genetic drift. When we're talking about gene flow, we're talking about gene frequencies changing as a result of migration. So when I think of this word gene flow, I think about genes flowing back and forth, okay, migrating back and forth. When we're talking about genetic drift, we're talking about gene frequencies drifting or changing randomly, and this tends to occur in small populations. Two examples of genetic drift are population bottle bottleneck and founder's effect. So let's talk a little bit about gene flow and the effects it has on populations. Gene flow is defined as the exchange of genes by migration of individuals between populations. So individuals are going back and forth between these two populations here. There's gene flow happening. The result of this is that if these two populations are very different at the beginning, over time, these populations are going to become more similar to each other because the genes are mixing between the two populations. Look at this problem here and see if you can answer it. I'm just, just pause the video and then I'll give you the answer. The answer here is C. Notice that this is telling you the frequency of the dominant allele in two different populations. Notice at the beginning at generation one, the, the frequency of the dominant allele in these two populations is very different. However, over time, the frequency of the dominant allele has become more similar in these two populations, suggesting that gene flow is happening between the two populations. When we're talking about genetic drift, we're talking about random changes or random drifting of the allele frequencies. And this happens as the result of a reduction in the size of a population. Reducing the size of a population leads to a couple different things. One, it decreases genetic variation in that population. Second, smaller populations are more susceptible to genetic drift, to random changes in the allele frequencies. There's two types of genetic drift, as I mentioned before. One is called population bottleneck. The other one is called founder's effect. Population bottlenecks are the result of some sort of catastrophic event that causes a drastic reduction in the population size. This can include, can include things like natural disasters, hunting, droughts, or so forth. Whenever a population bottleneck occurs, what happens is that the resulting survivors actually may have a different gene frequency than the original population just by chance alone. So we've seen a large population bottleneck in the cheetah population in the past. So we started out with a larger cheetah population. Something caused that population to be reduced really drastically. And the result of that is that we don't see a lot of genetic variation in the cheetah population that exists today. Uh, here is a way kind of to visualize what we're talking about when we talk about a population bottleneck. Here we have the parent population. These little beads are representing the alleles. Notice that there's an equal number of blue and yellow beads to start off. However, let's just say if some sort of population bottleneck occurs and only a small number of individuals survive. So the individuals that are poured into this glass are representing the survivors. Just by chance, so this is a result of sampling error, just by chance, notice that most of the survivors are blue. And what that's going to result in is that in the next generation, we have more blue individuals than yellow individuals, and therefore the gene frequency of that new population is very different from the parent generation. Okay, so that is an example of genetic drift. Another example of genetic drift is called a founder effect. This is when we have a small number of individuals, they leave one population, and they colonize a new territory or find a new population somewhere else. The result of this is that the frequencies, gene frequencies in that new population are likely to be different from that original population just by chance. And again, we're decreasing the genetic variation in that new population usually. An example of this would be the Amish population in the United States. The Amish population in the United States actually originated just from a few couples coming over from Europe. And it just happened that by chance, those individuals that started the new population had some very rare genes. For example, they carried the gene for polydactyly, which causes you to have more than 10 fingers. So it just happens that since the individuals that started that Amish population had that gene, we see a higher frequency of polydactyly or having more than 10 fingers in the Amish population than we would see in that original population that they came from. And again, that's an example of genetic drift.
Objective 5 says interpret graphs of gene frequencies in populations subject to natural selection. So natural selection is whenever you have differential survival of individuals in a population, and that's due to them having some sort of favorable genotype or some favorable gene. And this results in the favorable allele increasing in the population and the frequency of the unfavorable allele decreasing in the population. A really easy observable example of natural selection would be predation, looking at the effects of predation. So here we have two different types of beetles. We have green beetles and brown beetles. The brown beetles are able to camouflage themselves better on the bark. So they are going to be eaten less often and the green beetles are going to be eaten more often by predators. What this, what this is going to result in is that the frequency of the green allele is going to decrease in this population, whereas the frequency of the brown allele would increase in that population, causing changes in the allele frequencies in future generations. We could graph out these changes in allele frequencies. If you create a table showing the, fre the change over generations of the dominant allele represented by P, and the change in the frequency of the recessive allele represented by Q, and you graphed it, you might see something like this. In this case, you can see the frequency of the recessive allele is decreasing over time, whereas the frequency of the dominant allele is increasing over time. This is showing natural selection happening, and the dominant allele in this case is being favored. It is possible that the recessive allele could be favored for a certain gene, and then you would see a the red line would be increasing in this graph. So pretty much you want to just memorize these five assumptions, uh, know them by heart so that you can answer any questions associated with them. And remember that any violations of these assumptions can lead to evolution occurring. All right, so now I'm going to go through a couple different practice problems. What I recommend doing is that after I read the question, pause the video, try to answer the question on your own, and then push play to hear the answer. The first question is, which of the following does not violate Hardy-Weinberg law? The correct answer is D. Panthers have not been cited outside the state of Florida. This does not violate any of the assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg law, whereas Option A, Panthers numbers have been reduced to less than 50 individuals in the last decade, violates the assumption of a large population size. Females prefer to mate with larger males and smaller males violates the assumption of random mating. Panthers with light tan coats are more successful hunters than those with darker coats violates assumption of no natural selection. Because of habitat loss, accidents evolving cars, and reproductive problems, the population of Florida panthers has dropped sharply and is in danger of extinction. What specific sort of genetic drift is at work in the case of, Florida, of the Florida panther? Well, here we're talking about genetic drift. So we, only, we know there's only two examples of genetic drift that we talked about, population bottleneck or founder's effect. So if you had to pick from one of those, which would it be? The answer would be population bottleneck because we have some sort of catastrophic event causing the population to decrease. The following problems are all Hardy-Weinberg problems. If the frequency of the recessive allele in a population is 0.6, what is the frequency of the dominant allele? We know the frequency of the recessive allele is equal to Q, so anytime you see this word allele, we're talking about just P or Q, right? So Q equals 0.6. We, now we want to figure out what the frequency of the dominant allele is, so what P equals, we know that P equals 1 minus Q, and that's 0.4. So our answer to this question is 0.4. In the very endangered Florida panther, light tawny coats are dominant to darker coats. If the incidence of lighter coats in the population is 75%, what proportion of the population would be heterozygous? So remember the first thing that you want to do is set up a key. We know that the dominant phenotype is light tawny coats. The recessive phenotype is darker tan coats. What are they telling us? They're telling us the percentage of individuals with lighter coats. So that's 75%. So that's the dominant phenotype. Uh, to turn a percent into a frequency, just take the percent divided by 100. So we know the dominant phenotype is 0.75, but remember, we can never start with the dominant phenotype because that's equal to p squared plus 2pq, so we can't 
work with two variables at once. So we had to figure out what the recessive phenotype is. And just remember that you can easily figure that out by doing one minus the frequency of them having the dominant phenotype. So that's 0.25. And that gives us Q squared because the frequency of them having the recessive phenotype equals the frequency of them being homozygous recessive. So that's 0.25. What are they asking us to solve for here? It's a proportion of population with, that are heterozygous. So again, we're solving for 2PQ here. And we're solving for the proportion, which is just another word for frequency. In order to get from Q squared to 2PQ, we have to solve for Q and P first. So to solve for Q, we just take the square root of Q squared, and that's the square root of 0.25, which gives us 0.5. P equals 1 minus Q, which is 0.5. 2PQ equals the frequency of the heterozygotes, which is 2 times 0.5 times 0.5, which equals 0.5. And that is our final answer, because they're only asking us for the frequency of heterozygotes. The next question says, if the frequency of the dominant phenotype is 0.91 in a population, what is the frequency of the dominant allele? So again, make up your little key here. Dominant, the dominant phenotype is what they're giving us, right? So they're giving us 0.91. We cannot start with the dominant phenotype. I'll say this over and over and over again, but you'll realize that you sometimes accidentally get in the habit of trying to do that, but you're not going to get the right answer if you do that. So we got to figure out what the recessive is. 1 minus 0.91, that gives us 0 0.09. Remember, that equals Q squared. So Q squared equals 0 0.09. What are they asking us for in this case? Well, here they're asking us for the frequency of the dominant allele. As soon as you see this word allele, you know we're talking about P and Q. So here we know P equals the frequency of the dominant allele, so we're looking for P in this case. To get from Q squared to P, we first have to solve for Q, and then we can solve for P. Q equals the square root of Q squared, which is 0 0.09, or 0.3. P would equal 1 minus Q, which is 0.7, and our answer is 0.7. If 81% of a population is homozygous recessive for a given trait, then they want you to solve for these other three questions. Try this on your own, and then I'll go through the answers. So let's look at A. What is the predicted frequency of homozygous dominant individuals? Well, they're giving us Q squared, which is 0.81. We want to figure out what P squared is, right, homozygous dominant. So in order to get from Q squared to P, we first got to figure out what Q is. So take the square root of Q squared, that equals 0.9. Then you can figure out P is because P is 1 minus Q, which is, would give us 0.1. And then all you got to do is take P squared, and that gives us 0 0.01. That's our final answer. What is the predicted frequency of heterozygous individuals? Now we need to figure out what 2PQ is. We already figured out what P and Q is above, so just plug it into our equation. 2 times 0.1 times 0.9 will give you 0 .8, 0 0.18. What is the frequency of the dominant and recessive alleles in this population? Well, since we have the words alleles here, we're just, they're just asking us for P and Q. We already solved that above. So those are all the practice problems using Hardy-Weinberg equations. I hope it makes a little bit more sense to you now. I recommend going back and doing the practice test now and seeing if you can do these problems on your own.